Today, I want us to turn with me initially to Matthew chapter 6. I'm using this as an introduction to the topic I'm speaking about today. In Matthew chapter 6, from verse 9 to 13, we have what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. I don't want to read the entire prayer, though we will skirt through it quickly here. I want to look instead at verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And again, the end of verse 13, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The unique thing about this aspect of prayer is that the disciples had asked Jesus a very simple request. They had observed that the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees all were taught how to pray. Now, when we hear their request, teach us also how to pray, we might think they were looking about how to actually put together what they should pray about. But they were actually seeking how to approach God that he would hear them. <laughs> so this is an important thing to understand. So when Jesus constructs this simple example prayer, he brings across a number of factors. The first is who it's addressed to, which is God the Father. The second is he honours God by hallowing his name. And then he goes into prophecy. He prophesies about the future kingdom of God and how this kingdom is to be a reflection on earth of everything that's happening in heaven. This is prophetic. It has never happened. To this day, it still remains prophetic. After that, if we're looking through the concept of the prayer, we know he's talking about our daily needs, bread, the need for us to be forgiven by God, and the need for us to forgive others. He then asks to protect us from the evil of this world, Satan, Satan's uh, agents that are at work in this world, and to lead us carefully into protection towards the end. And then he goes back to prophecy. He closes the prayer with a confirmation of prophecy. Yours is that kingdom that he started off speaking about. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever. In other words, the construct of the prayer is all heavenly based on the kingdom of God. So, with that in mind, today's topic is the kingdom of God. And what we're going to start with is a quick grasp of what that kingdom consists of. As many will be aware, prophecy in the Bible concentrates on future events, but because of the time span, some of those events have already occurred. We've already received Jesus Christ as the Messiah who has died for the sins of the world. To us, this is no longer prophetic, but it's in the prophecies because when it was originally given, it was a promise of what was to come. We have seen Israel blessed and cursed because of their position. We've seen the temple built, destroyed, rebuilt, and destroyed again, all laid out in prophecy. We have seen the children of Israel scattered to the four winds, where they, for most part, still remain today. All these things were, at one time, the height of prophecy. Things that people could not quite get their head around believing this will happen. And yet, it all occurred. But there is another element of prophecy which has not occurred yet. And it's all centered around the kingdom. The other thing that we need to understand about this, perhaps very relevant to us, 
is that this part of prophecy has the most amount of prophecy spoken about than any other subject. The kingdom is the most important concept for God. So, with that in mind, we have to understand that the prophetic mentions in the Bible of the kingdom also split into three parts. The initial coming of the kingdom, the end of this age in which we live, and how, how it impacts upon the people initially. The middle part, when everyone is living in total peace and harmony with God and all is blessed. And the end part, when Satan is released again to upset the apple cart, so to speak, and to cause mankind to rebel once again against God. And that brings an end to this period of man's self-determination and the kingdom comes to an end as well. After that, we have a new heaven, a new earth, a new regime. And concerning the prophecies in it, very, very little, because that is still what is ahead of us, and God has not chosen to reveal that fully to us at this time. We have a bit, not a lot. As Paul says, when he refers to this in a letter, he indicates, as to what we shall be, we don't really know. But we will be like him in whatever way he is. That's a whole new way Paul could put it. Today I want to concentrate not on the first part of the kingdom, nor even on the last part of the kingdom. I want to look in the middle. I want to create a fictional date, fictional from our point of view, because we're only using it as a marker. We're going to say 500 years into the millennium. And I'm going to ask questions. I'll answer them too, so don't worry. <laughs> the question I want to ask, and I want us to think about, is this. What will it be like living 500 years into the millennia? What do we think will have changed for mankind? What do we think will apply? You might say, well... Unless you've got a time machine hidden somewhere, how could we possibly answer that? Well, the answer is, we do have a time machine. It's called the Holy Bible. And God, through the writings that he has recorded in advance for us, called prophecy, reveals the things that are to happen in the future with significant and perfected accuracy. And that's the point. What I'm going to share with you today is biblically provable. Biblically provable. And I'm going to take you on a few verses, not a lot. We showed that at the beginning that the focus of the early church was the kingdom. And that Jesus had focused the minds of the apostles, the disciples and the apostles, of course, on the kingdom and reaching that kingdom. And this message of the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom, shall be preached into all nations, then shall the end come. That is the commission given to the church. So the kingdom is very, very important. It is not, as many people believe, how many people you can get to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's not what the gospel message was. The gospel message is about the kingdom, nothing else. So, how did the church do it? How could they possibly have approached this subject? Well, they use things like Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 9. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling will go together. A little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear and the young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near a cobra's den and the young child will put its hand into a viper's nest. 
and they will neither hurt, harm, or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as water covers the sea. In today's economy, what I have just read sounds fantastical, to say the least. The nature of the animals changing to that extent doesn't sound sensible. Much being able to allow children out and know they are safe, completely safe. Nothing will harm them. And it's that nothing will harm them that I want us to think about first of all. You know, I'm sure, you have given it a lot of thought, that there are certain things which you just cannot help worry about when kids are out and about playing. For example, we all know the danger of rivers, don't we? If a child's near a river, there's always the worry, what happens if it slips? What happens if it falls in? And we know that these are real concerns and we know that people have lost their loved ones due to this. But imagine, if you will, with me, that this is a totally unknown thing 500 years into the millennia. No parent has ever lost a child through drowning. Can you imagine that? Can that just for one second resonate with you? Imagine the confidence and peace you would have as a parent if you know no harm, no harm is going to come upon them. You say, well, well I have to tell you this, but there is nowhere in the Bible where it says a child didn't drown. And you're right, there isn't. But there is evidence in the Bible telling us time and time again of God supernaturally working with water on behalf of human beings. I'm not getting you to turn to these, I'm just going to give you a few incidents. When the children of Israel were taken out of Egypt, God separated the Red Sea. It wasn't a small, shallow, inland lake of water that was low at the time when he took them across, so they just waded across, as some people have suggested. This was a massive sea used for shipping, still used for shipping, and God separated it so that the Israelites were able to travel with all that they had with them for a prolonged period of time on dry land through the center of this. When the Egyptians finally caught up with them, they thought they would follow. But their iron chariots began to bog into the sea floor. It became a slow process for them. So they were slowed up. And by the time they got to the center of the sea, with all the difficulties and experiences they were having, the last of the Israelites, their children, their flocks, their animals, were fully out of the sea. And with that, God dropped the water back onto the Egyptians, destroying the entire Egyptian army. It had such an effect that when the children of Israel, 40 years later, came into the land, the promised land, at Jericho, this was what they were told. We know what happened when God took you out of Egypt. We know he parted a sea for you and that the entire Egyptian army was destroyed. And we are terrified because we've seen what you can do. Your God is with you. And this is, this, this is what the spies were told when they came to Jericho. So you see, God can part water. And just to prove the point, he didn't do it once. He did it numerous times. When Joshua is crossing over before going up to Jericho, 
The Jordan River stops at a village called Adam. Now the village of Adam, as we like to call it sometimes, is a very industrious little place now. And if you were beside it, you would see that they would have been quite worried about what happened because the Bible's very exact. The water stopped, but it didn't stop. It just got higher and higher and higher and higher until all of the children of Israel on down the valley had crossed across safely across the Jordan. The water literally was held up on one side and just kept increasing. And for the town, they were really panicking. Because this water was going straight up in the air and should be flowing down over them and destroying them. They were terrified. And then when the Israelites had fully crossed and it took a significant time for this to happen, the water released. It didn't come in a torrent. It just nicely started again. Coming down all the way until finally it was a normal river. Now, the river itself, what are we told about it? This was flood season. It was at the strongest it was at that time of year. But God can do that. He can protect. He didn't even protect just the Israelites. He protected the nearby town. The water is completely subject to him. Okay, so that's dealing with a big crowd of people. But would God do it for individuals? This is the next thing we need to know. And I have a question for you. Do you know of any individuals who God literally parted water for? And the answer is, yes you do. One is called Elisha, and the other is called Elijah. And it happened on the same day for both of them. And it's a unique aspect. Because they didn't come and say to God, I'm crossing this brook, God, will you please stop the water? No. They took the mantle of authority that they were wearing and touched the water. And the water just separated. And that's the beauty of it. When Elisha was coming back over, had just received the authority, the mantle was now his, he was able to do the same. He touched the water and the water just opened up. 500 years into the millennia, the water is going to be doing the exact same thing because it has been given a command by God. You will not hurt nor harm in all my holy mountain. So if a child is playing and it falls into the river, we know that the river will respond as God intends. It won't hurt. We know, for example, that if you're in a place where there's poisonous plants, say for example you're over in America or somewhere along those lines and there's a thing called poison ivy. I've never actually come across it myself, but I don't think we have it, as far as I'm aware. But let's say that you come across it, apparently that if you were to hit poison ivy, it really hurts you. It burns, it's got a nasty type effect on your skin. But it won't then, because it won't do it, and it won't have it. Nettles will no longer sting you, that's one more local at home. <laughs> Thorns will no longer stick in your fingers when you lift a rose. None of these things will harm you anymore. Because God has made a covenant with the earth on your behalf at this time for this not to happen. Let's for a moment consider that covenant. Hosea 2 verse 18. Hosea 2 verse 18. Isn't it funny how you can never find the ones you're looking for? Hosea is just after Daniel by the way. In that day I will make a covenant for them. And the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and with the creeping things of the ground, bow and sword of battle, I will scatter from the earth and make them to lie down 
safely. What God is talking about here is he is going to change everything in the millennia. The earth will work in unison with man. There's another prophecy that we really do need to consider. Because it's one that we, we find difficult to get our head around. It's in Amos 9. Verses 13 to 15. Amos 9, 13 to 15. And for those who are in Joshua, it's going towards the New Testament. <laughs> Just a few pages. Verse 13. Amos 9. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. The treader of greats him who sows seed. The mountain will dip with sweet wine and the hills will float, flow with it. At no point, as far as we're aware, in the history of the earth, has there ever been such a blessing promised that the growing season will be such that you'll still be reaping what you had sown the year before when it's time to sow the new stuff again on a continual basis. Can you imagine, can you imagine how bountiful the earth is going to be at that time? There's going to be no famine, no disease, no pestilence, no hunger, no poverty, no want. Gone. Fully and completely gone. So when the church started telling people about these things, do you think the people were listening? Do you think the people said, I, I, I think that'd be good. I want to know about this kingdom. I want to understand about this kingdom. And the church was telling them nice and simply, this kingdom is to remain. Yes, God will prove it among your descendants for a thousand years. But the reality of the situation is, this is the promise that God has made to all mankind. And this kingdom is over all the earth. What else do we know about the kingdom? I said we're looking at a principle that's 500 years in. Well, there's no sin. There's no transgression. The people who would have been alive at that time, when the earth first came to knowledge of God, these people have all died off. The generation now alive 500 years later have never experienced hardship. They've never experienced want. They've never experienced war. They've never experienced hatred. They've never experienced any negativity or negative thought. The knowledge of God fills the entire earth. In fact, the language used is universal. No differences. In Sephaniah 3 verse 9 we read, I will restore pure speech to the people so that all of them will call in the name of the Lord and serve him. This is a prophecy relating to the fact that God will enable everybody to live at peace with him. Zephaniah 8 reflects a different time period of the kingdom. It's the time period at the beginning of this period when ten men grab a Jew and say to him, because they're all from different languages, Teach us your ways, for you know God. 
We know that this is at the beginning of the millennium period. We know this because they're looking for somebody to teach them and they have different languages. But when we're looking at this in, in Stephaniah 3 verse 9, we're, different, we're dealing with the middle of the millennium period. A time when all language is pure and everyone is right with God. There is another very important thing that we need to understand. It's in Isaiah, and if I can just get the right one, it will be really, really good. And for some reason, I just, it's just not jumping out at me, but that's all right. I'll tell you what it is. The simple fact is, God will not allow war to be taught anymore. Now, you might say to yourself, well, this is strange. We know that he's going to change the... I found it, actually. It's in Isaiah 2, 2 verse 4, and it's also in Micah 4, verse 3. And he will judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not, up, not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. I have a question. How do we learn war? I know immediately you're thinking about, you know, how the military train people to go out to fight. But that's not what God's referring to here. He says you're not going to learn war, not learn fighting. War is a different concept here. It's conflict, it's stress, it's competition. So how are you going to address this problem of not learning war anymore? 500 years into the millennia, there will be certain things that we take on a day-to-day -day basis that will not exist. And that is the most startling aspect of all. We know God will protect children from danger. We know that the animal's nature has changed. We know that the earth is bountiful. But we haven't looked at the change that occurs in man. Have you ever played take? I know, it's a little child's game, isn't it? The idea of take is very simple. Somebody is on. That means they've got to catch everybody else. And when they catch them, they have a choice. They can either make them tiggers like themselves, right? Or they can put them in prison. It depends on the variation of the game you're doing and how many you've got. In the first instant, what you're doing is you're recruiting people to your side to help you overcome the enemy. But there's another side to take for those people who are in prison. Anyone who has not been caught is able to go to the prison and if they can get there successfully without getting caught, they will need to touch the person and the person is free again to run about and be part of the game again. It's great fun, really enjoyable, and it teaches you war. That's war. Think about it. Every aspect of it is teaching you everything you need to know about war. Let's take rugby. Rugby's a great fun game, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> Let's go back a few hundred years, maybe a few thousand years, and we'll find that rugby comes directly from the concept of the gladiators. The idea was, if you're a gladiator, and you had to come against an enemy, you had to retain your footing. All right, you had a sword, a shield, and all the rest, but that's no good in training, because to just kill your own people. So what they would do is, without sword, without shield, or anything else, they would literally run at each other and impact 
Now, if you were a wee weakling, you know what happens to you. You get knocked right to the back. And it was no good. So, one of the things a gladiator had to be is well built, muscular, and know how to hold himself. Rugby teaches you that. It guides and directs you on how to do that because what is the principle? Overcome your opponent. Football? Skills needed to maintain speed, accuracy. All of these things teach war. We can go into the more modern ones. I mean, hurling in Ireland, for example. Does anyone really think that's not a war sport? It's known as coming directly from it. When you would be able, in a battle situation, to have literally lifted a weapon and flung it while running. All these things teach war. All these things will not be even a ninkling in the memory of anyone 500 years into the millennium. They'll all be gone. None of these will be taught anymore. That we find hard to understand. That the change will be so dynamic. Everything is changed. There won't be any churches 500 years into the millennium. Because you don't need anybody to teach people. Because everybody knows the truth. It's taught to them by their parents. They are growing up in it. It's a worldwide accepted truth. Anything contrary to this will not be permitted. It's scary, but the Bible does signify towards the end of the millennia when Satan is starting to get released. And remember, we look and say Satan's getting released, but it's not just Satan. Other spiritual forces are also getting released at that time because they're in prison, they are not judged. And because they are in prison and are about to be released again, they make havoc on the earth. And one of the things that they do is rise a rebellion. And they do that by making people think, well, if you lived down there closer to Jerusalem, you would be better off than where you are up here in these northern lands. The fact that they have plenty, that they are fully, fully looked after by God, that they have no poverty, no problems, no difficulty is not an option anymore because evil spirits are starting to influence them again. But at the very beginning of this process, the Bible puts a warning out. God says, in those days leading up to that time, if an individual starts to proclaim, teach falsehood, or says they're experiencing dreams, in other words, getting from spirits, because God no longer works in this way with mankind and hasn't done for hundreds of years, his own or her own parents will know enough to recognize that this evil cannot be allowed to remain. And that person will be put to death. This is leading up to that final rebellion. It won't happen in the middle because there is no one to cause those dreams or those problems or those difficulties. So I have one last question. <laughs> if God has removed Satan and all the demons, he has shown that the earth can live in perfect harmony and peace with him for a thousand years, never mind the wee bit of disturbance at the beginning or the wee bit of disturbance at the end. Why does he release Satan? What's the point? To understand that, you have to understand another element to the question. Why did he allow mankind to experience perfect 
harmony and peace with him for a thousand years at all. When he knew that mankind could not inherit eternity because he could never reach perfection. You see, the individuals living at this time have been placed back under a lot of the rules and laws that governed Israel. We know this because God says that at that time, when the nations are being worked with and allowed to come into this period of peace, he's going to have the holy days back. And if a nation chooses not to come and celebrate the holy day, he's going to stop that nation receiving any rain for a whole year. Is that fair? Is that loving? Is that merciful? Yes. Because there's another element to it. Imagine you have a family of children and you want to teach them. But one child in particular is being naughty. So you put in a sanction. And it's an agreed sanction and everyone knows the sanction, right? Well, if you don't inflict and use the sanction, then you're going to get no teaching, no warning to everybody else, and that child will literally do whatever they want. God's faced with that position. But let's say the sanction is, in our day and age, you're going to your bed early tonight. That's all right, it doesn't harm the child. And all the rest of the children know that that child has had to go to bed early that night. And he can, or he or she, can hear them, them, the other children, playing outside and having a good time. And that really irritates them. We know this because we've all experienced it to some degree, haven't we? <laughs> now, in the millennium, one of the things that God does is he puts a sanction upon nations that refuse to obey him. And why do they refuse to obey him? Because they say, we don't need to keep the old rules and regulations. It's not necessary for us to go up to Israel and keep the feast of trumpets, the feast of tabernacles, the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of, and so on. And their argument What's their argument? Very simple. Because these things were done away with. And yet they're forgetting the point. These things have just been introduced because Israel is the kingdom and it's the kingdom of Israel that is being blessed with the opportunity to lead and teach all the nations of the world for a thousand years. So it has to be on her ground, on her laws, on her rules. That doesn't mean that there will be much change for the rest of the world because most of these rules and things only apply to Israel. It only applies in that land, which is why the Satan wants them to invade it and take it at the end. But every nation is expected to come and worship the king there because that's where God has placed his name. So when we see that they talk about no rain, we know that we're only talking about the beginning and the end of this period. Do you know why it wouldn't work in the middle? Because the love of God wouldn't let it. No, no, let me rephrase that. The reflection of the love of God in humanity wouldn't let it. Well, think about it. If you're, well, we're a divided nation, aren't we? We are north and south here in Ireland. Well, let's say that for some reason, the north rebels totally against God and we're not allowed any rain. What do you think the size would be? 
if 500 years into the millennia, they're in a relationship with God and they love us as brothers and sisters, will they let us starve? No, they'll do what Joseph did. They will open up their abundance and feed us. Will they be breaking God's rules doing that? No, because all God said he's not gonna send rain. We don't, aren't permitted to grow our own crops. How does that affect us? Well, under those circumstances, we have to go cap in hand and acknowledge that we were wrong and let the nations around us feed us, care for us and look after us from the abundance God has given them because they obeyed him. Do you think we would learn the lesson quickly? Yes, very quickly. God has this worked out to a T. He knows exactly what he's doing. And when it's all finished and the thousand years is over, Humanity as we understand it will not exist anymore because everyone will be judged to be part of the everlasting kingdom or not. But that's a different sermon.